Welcome everybody to the end of the first full day uh, at Learning Human. Uh, definitely a different kind of summer camp. We're uh, thrilled that you're all uh, with us and we're going to give folks just another minute to uh, work their way in. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, or if you're in Australia tomorrow morning or in South Africa, as I see some people here in the wee hours of the morning, and there's my friend Reinhard from Germany. I don't know how you're getting up at this hour, but we're glad that you're all here around the campfire. Um, and we look forward to a really interesting and important conversation uh, around digital equity, uh, social and racial justice uh, this, uh, this evening around the campfire. And um, as you'll also see, and there are probably 40 or more people uh, in Verbella, which is our 3D uh, virtual uh, space. Uh, people are gathering on the beach uh, for uh, tonight's uh, gathering as well. And we welcome people who will be joining us tomorrow to find their way to Verbella for any number of the sessions that we'll be holding this week. Uh, I'm Lev Donick from uh, ASU. Uh, my job this week is actually as the camp chef. Uh, that gives me uh, relatively uh, little to do, which is okay. Uh, as this is virtual food for, for the mind, uh, but it does afford me a chance to introduce uh, very briefly three friends and colleagues. Um, here's the context that I would offer. Um, the, the concept of digital equity, social and racial justice, even though we have, it's become very heightened, uh, I would say in the consciousness of sort of the middle, middle class uh, of the sort of the white community in this country for sure, only in relatively recent terms, COVID being one issue that made it clear that some people have access to the internet and apparently a whole bunch don't and you can't actually learn if you don't have access to the internet. And social and racial justice, obviously we've had another su summer of tragedy, of, of, uh, of uh, murder uh, on the streets. Um, and uh, as we're gonna find out this evening, uh, this is not new. None of this is new actually. And uh, we have the opportunity to both understand the history of the movement around digital equity and inclusion, as well as its, its systemic and historic interface to social and racial justice. Uh, and uh, I'm going to just uh, afford a chance to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and friend, Larry Irving. Uh, not so long ago, uh, Larry Irving, uh, when working for uh, the Clinton administration, actually coined the term digital divide. And I'm going to let him start the story and maybe give us some insights as to what was the context and was there in fact an intersection between your uh, not only analysis but your advocacy for engaging in digital uh, equity and digital inclusion. And after you're done, I'm just going to open it up because I know better because I know these three people. Nicole Turner-Lee is uh, with Brookings and she's gonna jump right in. And uh, my uh, friend and, and former colleague, and when we worked together uh, in Ohio, uh, Josh Edmonds, who's now in Detroit, you guys just carry on. And if for some reason, and I doubt it very much, things start to go sideways, I'll jump in. Otherwise, have a lot of fun. Why don't you kick us off, Larry? Thank you, Lev. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. The title of this session is kind of my life. I'm, I'm a brother from Brooklyn. I was born in the projects of Brooklyn to working class family. I'm a public school educated. Public library was the reason I got out of New York and got to Northwestern University. I'm a lawyer by training. So it's 1992, 93. I've never been on the internet and I get this job as the internet policy advisor to Bill Clinton, Al Gore and the then Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown. I'd gone to school in the Bay Area after going to school at Northwestern, I went to Stanford for law school. I'm out there in the Bay Area with Ron Brown. We're trying to tell people there's this thing called the internet. At the time, there were like 15, 20 million people on the planet that knew this thing existed. And this internet was gonna be important. Go down to Cupertino, California. And uh, Nicole's heard this story, you've heard this story, but others haven't. Go down to Cupertino, California. We see the future. I literally saw the future. I saw in this one classroom, about 25, 30 kids, eight to, an, um, to a table, each kid had an iMac in front of them. 30 IMAX in this room and these kids are sitting in front of it. It was an amazing, an amazing experience. And I'm like, this is the future. That same day, Ron Brown and I went up to um, Hunters Point, California, Thurgood Marshall High School. And we saw the kids there. And the only technology in that school was a metal detector. Even the office, uh, the administrative offices didn't have a computer in there. A 40 minute drive in one state, in one little, one little Bay Area, 
and one group of kids was going to be getting prepared for the future that we have now, and another group of kids had no concept that the internet or computers even existed. And that's what led to the work we did in the digital divide. I knew that the anecdote had power, but I knew the data would drive decisions. And from that, that experience, we started doing data on who in this country had access to the internet and who didn't. And I'm going to end with this. 25 years ago this month, 25 years ago this month was the first digital, digital divide report. We call it falling through the net, information haves and have nots in rural and urban America. And it, we found five reasons that you wouldn't be on the internet in, in, 2000, in 1995. Age, income, education, race, and geography. Those are the reasons people weren't on the internet in 1995. You go or had computers in 1995. If you looked at the most recent surveys, whether it's Pew, whether it's Common Sense Media, whether it's uh, the Commerce Department now, if you're black or brown, if you're elderly, if you live in a rural area, if you have less than a high school education, if you're low income, you're still less likely to have the internet. In 25 years, we haven't really fixed a problem that we first identified 25 years ago. And here's the thing that makes me crazy. I pick up my Sunday New York Times, and the, um, the New York Times, if it's some great revelation, talks about the fact that there's a digital divide and American kids aren't ready for school. And then they talk about access to the internet is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. In, Jan in July of 1999, 21 years ago, when I released on July 12th, when I released the last of the three digital divide reports that I released, the first paragraph I said, in the next century, the civil rights issue of the future will be access to technology. Took New York Times 21 years to figure that out. Took the rest of the country 21 years to figure it out. But fortunately, folks like Nicole and, and Josh are actually making the difference that we need to have made. With that, I'll turn it to them. So, I mean, I could pick it up. I mean, I forgot, you know, Lev, I, I don't camp much. I'm a city girl too. So all this stuff about camping and campfires is all new to me. And I'm glad I'm in the comfort <laughs> of um, my home because people tell you I glamp, I don't camp, okay? <laughs> so, um, so I had to, you know, sort of like Larry's got Chicago behind him. So don't be fooled people. He's actually, you know, at the waterfront of Chicago. Brooklyn. It's not actually out there. <laughs> So, you know, I want to like pick up on what Larry said, and I want to actually um, publicly thank you, Lev, and publicly thank Larry as well as Josh, because Larry really was a person who impressed upon my heart around the digital divide. I think I remember reading the Fall Through the Net reports, and I was thinking like, what is this, right? And at that time, I was a PhD candidate at Northwestern, uh, working on my dissertation around, you know, income inequality among African American kids that lived in some of the most concentrated public housing developments in the country, and that would be Robert Taylor Homes. And I actually wrote my dissertation on nothing related to technology, actually. It was on uh, the civil rights movement and the type of collective memory African Americans had when it came to their experiences leading up to President Obama. Uh, I, I talked about him even before he was actually created, because uh, in Chicago, there was a huge black middle class. But I got into tech and I want to sort of follow what Larry's talking about in terms of our experiences so we could kind of, you know, I guess when you do camp, you tell these stories, you know, when you're sitting down doing s'mores and stuff about who you are. Um, you know, I got into this debate and honestly where I met Lev, uh, being a person who was a practitioner. So I started with um, the Community Technology Center movement of which I actually built computer labs in Chicago. After being in school and fin doing my residency, I needed something else to do. And people who know me in my adult life know I always try to find more things to do than I probably have time for. But I found myself in a public housing development with the African-American kids, teaching them how to use 386 computers. And if you remember 386 computers, they had DVDs and CD-ROMs. <laughs> and you would literally put those in sort of counts the top of the computer so that the CD would actually skip. And these kids were dealing with some of the oldest of the old when it came to tech. And that kind of motivated me because around the time that Larry's report came out, there was a report that came out around new jobs migrating to online versus inline. And so in this computer lab, which was in a portable housing complex, you had people that were coming in there and they were sort of playing games and checking out what you could do. I mean, AOL for people who are listening was like still that crazy modem sound. Like it wasn't anything like the internet that we know today. Long story short, when the civil service jobs went online for TSA, uh, there were tons of adults that found themselves in the computer labs trying to apply for a job. And while I was sitting at Northwestern working on my dissertation on the black middle class, 
I became very curious on how we were going to break the trajectory of poverty and social inequalities for people of color if they didn't know about technology. I was fortunate I went to an undergraduate school where we had the internet, but I saw just how important it was for people to be connected. That literally started my journey. I landed up finishing my PhD on the black middle class, but then I broke out of the academy and decided to actually stay in the community technology center movement and built about, um, at about 400 computers across the city of Chicago before I left. And Larry's comments in that digital divide really stuck with me back then. And they stick to me in my new role at Brookings in the policy research perspective. As a sociologist, I always try to consider the overlay of systemic inequalities. And we're at an inflection point in this country where not only are we dealing with the inequalities of the digital internet, but we're also dealing with inequalities related to econ economics, social, political, and racial. And as it's been suggested, these are not new. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I've been in conversations for the last three to four months where people are like, oh my God, this digital divide. They're like, it just moved from seventh to the first place. I was like, it's always been first place in my book. This is all I study. But the bottom line is we're realizing after all of these years, the very technology that has been used to le and leveraged to solve social problems, which is how I actually got indoctrinated into tech, has actually become much more complicated. So when Larry talked about the digital divide being between the haves and the have nots, what we're looking at now is a more complicated divide. It's not just about not having a computer or not having broadband access. In many instances, it's about not having a credit card to actually get an Uber. It's about not having the right type of bandwidth to be able to run very uh, robust multimedia that you may need for distance learning. It's about being unable to be intuitive about the technology because your data is now the currency that drives these networks. And so we've shifted from what I believe has been sort of this possibility of inclusivity from a very binary construction of what digital access looks like to something that is now reframing, I think the American and global narrative when it comes to economic, social, and political opportunities. Former FCC Chairman Reed Hunt used years ago at an Aspen Institute forum, this is now the new public square. And as a new public square, if you are not on it, you are not in it. And so I gotta do a shameless plug. I'm working on a book right now called Digital Invisibility, uh, how the internet is creating the new underclass. And after traveling before the pandemic to about seven cities across the country, listening and talking to people, not having on my DC gear, but essentially putting on my sweatpants um, and jeans and just walking around neighborhoods, you would be surprised by how disconnected people are. Young man in Stanton, Virginia, his minutes run out two weeks into the month. He's a day laborer, he cannot find work. Farmer who sits and sees the uh, extent to which the last mile makes it right outside of his farm. As a result, he cannot order equipment. Elderly woman in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, or girl, actually black girls in Hartford, Connecticut, that have to walk to McDonald's to do their homework before the pandemic, simply because they, one, don't have access in the school because half of the school is vacant, but two, because they can't afford it. These were all just done in 2019, 2020. <laughs> Fast forward to the pandemic, and what we basically have seen is that this problem has become worse, amplified, when you're now dealing with 53 million school-aged children that have to stay home, 12 to 15 million of them do not have broadband access at, at their homes, 35% of them have one device that has to be shared among a working parent and multiple siblings. It's shameful what we've actually done to sort of disintegrate and to really, uh, I think, really attack the very fabric of what it means to be in a new digital economy, which is driving the jobs, the discourse, as well as the future opportunities that people have for success. So I take this personal. Larry knows, Lev knows, this is all I talk about, Josh knows. Um, in fact, I, I feel so old, Larry. Josh is in the neighborhood that I worked in <laughs> when I was actually doing computer tech work. <laughs> now he's the young person doing it. But I, I, I share that as I wrap up, that as we have this conversation around this campfire, part of the challenge that we're dealing with now is we seem to still be applying the same solutions to the curing of the problem. And in light of the fact that we now have a technology that no longer sounds like a modem, no longer operates off of a PC that you have at home, is largely driven by these portable devices of the power of technology that people have in their purses and their pockets. What I found in my book, and I'll end here, is that 
this overlay of what our Larry talked about, and I call it accessibility, affordability, and availability, is actually complicating the trajectories of life chances for millions of people. And that's why I call my book The New Underclass. That farmer who cannot actually transition to precision agriculture or order or compete against large Purdue farming uh, uh, places, he's disadvantaged, even though in many respects he looks quite wealthy. That young man who actually wants to work can't work because his minutes come out, he's disadvantaged. And so I was inspired when I was in graduate school by Michael Harrington's work, The Other America, where he said that the poverty became so entrenched that at a certain point, the United States started to stop counting the number of people that were in the unemployment lines. And I would actually argue that today, the digital divide, digital lack of access is very similar to that. We don't know what people are missing and how we are disadvantaged them further from the economic and social benefits of our society just because we have not made this a priority. So I'll stop there and I'll take my turn back up. Um, and shout out to all the people who support me on the glamping idea on the chat. I'm with you. <laughs> and we're gonna make this fun as we go through the conversation. <laughs> so I, I do this to myself. I do this to myself. I literally am like, okay, fine. I'm gonna go after Larry and Nicole. Uh, and then I, I had to follow up to this. And then if I did it beforehand, I'd be watching the entire time sweating like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So yeah, I, whatever. Um, like it's, it's, it, this doesn't happen enough to me, so I should expect this to happen. But um, you know, one, I want to thank Lev, Larry, and Nicole. Uh, this is, and, and, and everybody who's tuning in, um, you know, whenever we have this conversation, um, it, it, it's interesting for me in my current role. Um, I, I think uh, Larry and Nicole just did an incredible job of explaining like the, the history of it. And honestly, they, they predate me on the history a bit. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that too much. <laughs> but, but, you know, in my current role in Detroit, so I, I'm the director of digital inclusion at the city of Detroit. And one of the things that I've been really focusing on, um, it's just, Levels and levels of nuance, and bear with me because we're at a campfire, but like I've been focusing on power uh, and power dynamics and the perception of that, um, because when it comes to this specific topic, I think when we start talking about equity, I think when we start talking about justice, uh, this is at the intersection of power, who has it and who doesn't, and who historically has it, and that's where equity comes in. And when I'm having the conversation about um, uh, specifically digital access. I mean, I'll just say internet. Uh, I look at this in so many different levels. One, uh, for those who are familiar with the, the, the U.S. federal minimum wage, um, you know, no one, no state entity is going to defer to the minimum wage and say, oh, well, that's what the federal minimum wage is, so therefore that's good enough for us. But yet, when it comes to internet and broadband in America, we'll say, well, that's the federal designation of high-speed internet, so that should be good enough for all of us. And uh, it's not. And so when I'm having the conversation with folks in Detroit, it's been saying, how do we go one step further? How do we look at um, actually empowering people? How do we build out an operation? I don't believe um, that obviously this is something that we solve tomorrow. I think we are going to have to continue solving it. Um, this isn't connecting everybody to internet. This isn't getting everybody a computer. It's more than that. And I think that we trivialize the issue uh, quite a bit at times when we just focus on the internet part. And, th and th now we need to, too. But it's like, it's, it's everything. Uh, I remember when I was working in public housing in Cleveland, uh, there was an anecdote that just stuck with me. Uh, I was giving a speech about signing up for low cost internet. And I was reading to like a donut focus group to a group of residents. And I was like, okay, and uh, this is for low income residents. And <laughs> someone stopped me. And they're like, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. I might not have a whole lot of money, but I'm not low income. And that type of like, they were rejecting the label. Now I could point at it and be like, uh, sir, <laughs> like clearly like, e -e. but it's like, no, they're rejecting the label. And I think sometimes uh, th that anecdote has stuck with me and I, I use that in the work in Detroit because as I'm engaging people, I'm like, okay, how do I create an ecosystem-wide movement that's operationalized, that people buy in, but they're not it's not getting like stigmatized in the same way that uh, public transit has in many communities? Like, how do we actually look at this thing to say, all right, collectively, I want to empower Detroiters. 
Uh, when I look at the, the nationally speaking, when I'm, I'm looking at the folks who are trying to tackle this issue uh, specifically, and I'll be very frank, uh, incredibly diverse cities, and I'm seeing those leaders not really being empowered in their community. I had a call with a brilliant person from Los Angeles. And this woman is in the, um, the, 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 not, she, she works for the city in a capacity that's similar to mine, yet she's not really empowered to do the work. And I think that when we have this conversation, it's collectively empowering people who are doing the work and empowering people within the community. There's a lot more power that needs to go around and that's not happening. And so your local leaders on the ground oftentimes are coming up with recommendations that are incredibly old outdated that don't really get to the root of the issue. They're just band-aids. Uh, I'll be honest. And man, this is being recorded. Oh gosh. Well, whatever. Um, so like <laughs> I was talking to, um, a lot of funders, like we've raised, uh, within the past two years, $32 million of our own private capital in Detroit to bridge the digital divide or at least address it. And like, uh, there was, um, one funder who said, Josh, if we were to connect every single household right now in Detroit, how much would that cost? And I'm like, no, like I refuse to answer that question. Not because I don't see the value of connecting every single household, but it's like, you can't pay your way out of this issue. And I think that's something that I want to make very clear. And it's, it's, it, I'm saying this from a position of incredible private privilege that I'm getting in, in, in the local Detroit ecosystem. We literally, I'm backed by resident billionaire, Dan Gilbert. I mean, literally saying I am personally invested in bringing the Detroit digital divide, which is great. But it's like, look, that money isn't going to solve it. And like, I think that sometimes when we're having this conversation, so many people have historically been underfunded and have always made the case, we need more federal funding, we need more funding, funding, funding. And I'm like, yes, you need the funding. But at the same time, does that funding come with power? Does that funding come with people being able to tell that narrative beyond, or are you going to pigeonhole the people and then say, you can only do this and it's only going to go for that? Because I'll say it. We need unconventional solutions. We absolutely do. One of the things that um, a resident told me in Detroit, as we were talking about those low cost internet offers, um, kind of pulled me aside and said, hey man, you're doing this the wrong way. Like, you don't necessarily need to talk about low cost internet. Just say, I got that internet on the low. And like, that was something where we, we, we kind of laughed at it, but they're like, look, low cost internet from the corporate corporation doesn't stick. But I will tell anyone, if you go to a black barbershop, let's say two years ago, <laughs> what was in those barbershops? Amazon fire sticks. And everybody was walking around saying, man, I can jailbreak that fire stick. You ain't got to worry about it. I can do that. And it's like, okay, that's the type of stuff that we need to really be cognizant of and saying like, look, we're not saying, oh, well, if you're at snap level and if you're at, like, no, because that's disempowering. Like who wants to actually have to go through and reveal that like they're at that status or that they're getting the less than internet. Like, no, like let's actually meet people where they are and say, Hey man, you know, I can get it for nine dollars and 95 cents for the internet. Like, you know, who, who could do better than that? And like meeting people where they are there, that's where we start shifting the narrative. Um, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say on this, uh, before we open this up, when I'm having this conversation and uh, about empowering people, I'm very cognizant of the fact that, look, Detroit is 85% black. And so when I'm looking at Detroit, yeah, I'm not from there, I'm from Cleveland, but it's like, look, I can't, you know, be successful in what I'm doing. And then at the same time, look and see a community that's suffering that perceivably is me. And so I can't separate myself from this. And so when I'm bringing these other elements to the table here, it's, it's tapping into a certain level of passion. And I, I, I owe it uh, to, to, to the community that's housing me here. And so when I'm having the conversation about empowering people, it's even going beyond and saying like, okay, I'm now trying to have a conversation on esports. Like, how can I make esports a digital equity priority? How do I then look at kids who are gaming and might not having and not having adequate internet and saying, okay, that might be a policy angle. How do I then start flipping? And, and it, because I think there's a lot of people on the other side who are preconceived to give the answers that they know that can derail us. And so it's always a game of staying a step ahead, knowing your community incredibly well, and then distributing that power as much as you can. And so I know I'm proximate to some very, very large funders in our community, uh, the, the mayor, the state, and all these people are pouring into what we're doing in Detroit, which is great. I know that's not the reality in every city. So I'll tell everyone, Detroit, we're going to get it right. I promise you, we will get it right. Um, and uh, I, I really want to see the model that we're pushing more so from the collective empowerment approach to go across in other cities, because I'm talking to people, local leaders in the community all the time, 
who are not empowered and who cannot, who do not feel like they can make a difference in this topic, aside from giving some, some general platitudes and, and, you know, giving some knee jerk things and some cool phrases, which are really cool sometimes, but like empowering those people. That's, that's what I want to see. So I'll, I'll, I'll end mine there. <laughs> so I, I want to respond, I think, to us to some things that you said, because I think it's so interesting how you sort of put in this whole slogan of power. I mean, I think implicit in both what Larry and I were talking about too is right, whoever is actually um, controlling these systems obviously makes a lot of decisions on, you know, where these systems are developed and built and who gets access to them. And I really do like what you're talking about in terms of sort of creating this other internet, this dual ecosystem. Because when I was actually, um, you know, as I shared, I, I did a lot of digital activism before I actually went to work in the policy space. And it was very, and when people used to actually say the same thing that you just said, I said, you know, low income people have bigger TVs than I have as a graduate student. I don't see why we're making this a poverty issue in terms of their ability to access this. We saw grandmothers who would purchase computers at that time, I'll date myself, uh, Gateway was the biggest computer provider on Fingerhut. And when I was working in one public housing building, there were all these gateways that were coming in because I was buying them for the computer lab, but grandmothers were buying them for their kids. So this whole idea that people generally don't understand this shift towards a digital economy, I think is, is not true, which is why I actually chose to go out and do these site field visits because I needed to personalize and humanize the people that we often in DC talk about, you know, as if they don't exist. But I love also, you know, this thing around um, equity, versus equality and where we actually fall now. I mean, I've been in Larry a little bit longer than me, but we've been in this state where we went from digital divide to digital inclusion, to content divide, to content inclusion, back to digital equity. So we've had this back and forth digital, you know, where now it's so funny when I hear people talk about digital divide and they're mostly talking about deployment. I almost like want to cringe because the digital divide was never about just building more networks, building more uh, supply without the demand. But I think the critical thing that you're actually referencing is where I'm getting at, is that for people who are listening, we're now at this inflection point where digital is defining our realities. It's defining where we live. It defines how we learn. It defines how we earn. In some cases, it defines how we love. And all of these things sort of configure themselves where if you are part of the digital economy, you are have accessibility to more uh, efficient, seamless, easy transactions, right? As well as connections which for people of color and uh, people who have been historically disadvantaged, the idea that these uh, areas can migrate online have cost to people who can't get there. So years ago, when I was working in the city of Chicago, uh, a woman was working alongside of me and we both had kids around the same time. Her son had asthma. She had to take three buses to get to Rush Hospital. I just had to go to the PPO down the street. You now fast forward to telehealth and now there's this opportunity to equalize or democratize healthcare by giving people remote access. But yet we still have challenges with that, right? Particularly in Larry, I want you to jump in in the Beltway when it comes to looking at these use cases. So I would love to, as I'm looking at the chat, sort of think about this conversation going forward is, we know we have a digital access prob divide problem that is very much rooted in power structures. And we know for years that we've actually chosen social service paradigms to apply to a 21st century model for how we engage economically, socially, politically. And now we're at this new place, I think with COVID, where there are particular use cases like education, like healthcare, like employment that are primarily online, which now create even deeper effects on communities that are not connected. And so I wanna pivot over to Larry. You know, since we're, so, we're actually so, we're camping, you so, know, like let's talk about this, right? <laughs> so what's interesting is the past is prologue. Um, everything in the '90s when no one had the internet. A lot of you all know Laura Breeden, the smartest person about in, involved in technology I've ever met is Laura Breeden. Laura is now the chair of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and Laura came to work for me. Why? Because you know, I'm one of those people who knows the only way I'm going to succeed is hire people a lot smarter than me. And one of the things that Laura taught me early on was all of the solutions to all of the problems we were trying to deal with this with this internet are local problems. What folks may not realize in 1993, there weren't any schools connected to the internet. There were no community, um, computer technology centers. There was no such thing as telemedicine. There were libraries weren't connected. So what Laura did, her genius was, look, we're gonna create this grants program. I got the money, um, Al Gore built it and gave me the money. And we put it together a grant program, Laura, I, and, and some folks, a whole bunch of Clinton folks, and the question was, if we give you a grant, what problem will you solve? 
How will you make this better for your community? To your point, Josh, let's empower people in the community to solve their problems using this technology. We need to get back to that reality. Now, in saying that, we need billions of dollars to connect people. Yeah. We still have to connect our schools and our community. We still have to get our libraries in our community. We still have to give people access to, um, uh, to, to gear. They're, we're going to go back. If folks on listening to this session take away one thing, I'm from the hood, right? The neighborhood I grew up in in Southeast Queens, New York, 43% of the students in my elementary school do not have an internet connection, do not have a, a computing device, or both. 43%, 43 out of every 100 students. It's a lot like what you're seeing in, in Detroit with 60% in some of the schools and 80% of schools, Josh. Those kids have already lost three months last semester. I don't know about you, but when I took the summers off, it took me a month or two to get back in the gear, and then those kids had access to, te to technology in the summer, so they're back. Now, if they lose another three to four months and we don't figure out this remote learning thing, you're only six years old once, you're only seven years old once, you only go to seventh grade once, it compounds it. So you, if, you, if, you, if these seven and eight-year-olds go back to school in August and September and they lose another three to four months and we haven't made the investment in those kids starting next month to get them back in track so they can be a seventh grader, an eighth grader, or a six-year-old, seven-year-old, we're going to lose them. Those solutions are going to be partly local, but it's going to take federal and state money to make this happen. So I don't, I'm hearing you, Josh, and I want the solution. You know, what's going to happen in Brooklyn is going to be different than what happened in Detroit. And what's going to happen in Detroit is going to be different from the uh, Navajo right. Reservation where 70% of people don't have internet right. access. Right. But every one of those kids deserves it. And what we've got to be thinking about is our hair has got to be on fire. Now, my hair has been on fire for a while. As you can see, it, it, it burns <laughs> to a crisp. But, 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 but the reality is we've got some real hard thinking to do. And I'm looking at these questions down here. Right. And a lot of it is existential. I'm about solution oriented right now. What am I going to do for that kid at PS 118? What am I doing that kid in Wayne County who doesn't have access tomorrow? Who's got to start school September 1? Well, Larry, I, I got a solution for that, Josh. I don't want to, I want you to jump in. So I'm actually publishing a blog on this that should come out actually tomorrow or the next day around what is a remote access blueprint look like for schools. So I do actually think it's appropriate because there's a lot of questions for that. So at, before the pandemic, and I see there's a lot of people from the great old state of Arizona, I actually came to Arizona. I went to the west side of Phoenix to actually talk to a school which was predominantly um, comprised of the students of undocumented immigrants. Um, I had just left rural Alabama talking to another school, and both of these schools were actually um, beneficiaries of Obama's Connect Ed program. So every student had a one-to-one -one solution when it came to a tablet. The interesting thing, and my paper is available at Brookings, what I found prior to COVID is exactly what you and Josh are sort of talking about. We had all this technology in the school because a lot of federal programs have actually been the investors in smart boards and 3D printers and all this other stuff within the classroom. But we had very little local digital infrastructure. So in Arizona, both libraries were about five miles apart from the school. In addition to that, while every kid had a cell phone to ensure that, because they're in Maricopa County, to ensure that they weren't gonna be picked up or deported. The bottom line is that they weren't using to improve quality of life. And the same thing in Alabama, this particular principal had all of the students lined up in the front of the school, trying to tap into access. She was able to get a uh, broadband solution on the tablets, but again, 10 miles apart from the local library. I mean, who's gonna walk in rural South Alabama, uh, Marion County, Marion all the way to the library, what was it gonna happen? Now to Josh's point, in both in Alabama, there was a woman who sold all of her belongings from Bridgeport, Connecticut, and opened up an ice cream shop that gave free Wi-Fi to the kids. And so she tried to create a local solution to actually do that. Fast forward two weeks, I released that paper, we go into the pandemic. So as Larry's talking about his hair, I'm talking about my mind and my exhaustion because I've been on the phone with state superintendents, school educators, et cetera. So I want to actually just address real quick, I think, where you see that blend, and I'll shut up. I think... To Larry's point, we have seen on the news at school reopening a lot of discussion around how we're going to keep the kids safe, how we're going to keep the kids safe, how we're going to keep the kids safe. The bottom line is we're going to do the best that we can, but there will be a child, there will be a, an educator that will get sick, will get infected for the first time or reinfected, and they will go home. And to Larry's point, do we spend another three to six months trying to figure out how to get that kid back? So what I've been advocating for and writing about, and this new blog coming out will explicate everything I've learned over the last four months, is that every school district needs a remote access plan. 
A remote access plan as basic as having this first component. You need to ask your, you, your students and your teachers who provides them with broadband service. <laughs> so one of the things I found out is that most of the teachers and most of the superintendents and most of the local school principals didn't even know who was providing the broadband service to the families that they had. It wasn't a question. This is what I love about Larry and how he's positioned the digital divide of commerce. It wasn't like a question to say, okay, young man, what's your address? What's your phone number? Do you have broadband at home? <laughs> young lady, who is your provider? Because we had all of these private sector programs, but not a lot of people knew about them because we didn't collect data. So as part of my remote access plan, we must collect data. Local data to the school district, uh, granular data to the zip code of the particular schools that are servicing that area. Second thing, we had lots of computers at school during the pandemic and no way to get them to the kids at home. And for the kids that had computers at home, they didn't have broadband. So we had this other thing that I want to push out. I'll be really, really quick. We need a digital toolkit. About five, 10 years ago, Nicholas Negroponte actually came out with the slogan with a former colleague of mine, one laptop per child. We laughed that off because broadband was number seven. We would be shameful if we go into this new school district and our kids don't have 21st century tools. What is their connectivity look like in terms of device? Is there a Wi-Fi hotspot for kids who do not have broadband at home? E-rate pays for that at libraries. I've got school districts that are actually procuring those now with their private sector partners. Uh, if a kid doesn't have it, goes to my third point, Josh, right on what you're talking about. If you have a kid that you can't get a hotspot to, they can't get broadband at home because they don't have a private, uh, a private uh, a provider. The third thing, what we miss in this pandemic is that our kids who were on free and reduced price lunch in urban areas lived in public housing. And what I found a lot of educators did not do was go to our public, public housing property managers and ask them to open up their Wi-Fi. For the kids that actually lived in rural communities, we never thought about the church, putting an antenna on the church. I have so many schools calling me now trying to build Wi-Fi and mesh networks. And I always say to them, that's not what you do. <laughs> what you need to do is figure out how do you partner. I'll leave the rest of it for my blog, but my point is, it's imperative, given that distance learning, and I wanna to speak to all the educators, it's not necessarily the best, I mean, we, we've been arguing about screen time and how much time and what time and what content and how safe it is, but the bottom line is a new 21st century tool, just like the young man I talked about who needs the minutes to get a job, is digital. And so any school that goes into the school year without thinking about how to create these robust spaces for connectivity, we're gonna have a problem because we're going to see, I think to Larry's point, I th and I'm calling it the educational meltdown, particularly of black and brown kids who are already behind, in addition to kids with special needs who will not have the tools to continue the cognitive learning that they need to do while they are out of school. And educators too, there were educators, this is the last thing I forgot to say, I'm sorry, Josh, I'm sorry. There were educators that did not have internet access. And we didn't even recognize that educators were sitting in some of those digital parking lots, actually tapping into the Wi-Fi of their school or their, or their local library. My suggestion, why not create digital parks, repurpose the vacant buildings that will be in our big cities to actually bring Wi-Fi to those places. Somebody just put up there, repurposing and reimagining education is something I've been trying to work on to allow us to have this joint strategy for success. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> what, what, One of the things that um, I want to, I guess, hi highlight a bit more. So this is like the inflection point internally within the city that we're having, and even, you know, obviously larger within the nation. Uh, so one of the things that we were able to do uh, in a pretty short time, raised $23 million of private capital to ensure every single public school kid, kid got a device, um, a new one with tech support and six months of LTE service with an agreement to sign them up for um, Comcast Internet Essentials. Uh, and one of the things that I kind of had in the back of my mind the entire time, which is like, yeah, no, it, it's great work, happy that it's getting done. But there were some things that happened during the process that just made me pause a little bit. Uh, one, I know that people are looking at LTE as a, a potential solution. So I did uh, the speed testing <laughs> throughout Detroit uh, because I was like, what I'm not going to do is push this out 
and then have people mad at me. And so I'm like, no, 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 no. And so speed testing, I literally talked to every single internet provider uh, and said, guys, look, this is going to be a massive undertaking that we're doing. Uh, one, we're doing like no, no throttling. If you guys are going to throttle, like, you know, it's after 50 gigs. So I'm like, okay, all right, I'll take that. But like monthly, but like when I started doing that uh, speed testing, some of the providers started getting nervous. He's like, oh, well, what are you doing that for? And it's like, well, you know, I need to have that oversight because if not me, then who? Uh, I can't trust you. Uh, and, and, and so like when I started doing that, what I found uh, was a, there wasn't a single provider in Detroit that I could confidently say was an LTE solution. And so I want to make that very clear. Um, and even with some of like some folks will mention some of the subsidized uh, LTE providers and MVNOs. And even when I was testing their speeds, I'm like, uh, this isn't broadband. I really can't use this. And I want to say that that's where we start going into the equity conversation a bit more. It's one thing to talk about access, but it's another thing to talk about like the access that we actually need, like the access, like if we're looking at uh, a, a family, uh, maybe a four person, five person, six person family, okay, well then maybe the baseline isn't good enough. And I want to like keep drilling that point in. Uh, I'm having conversations and a, um, uh, whenever I have conversations about sizzle, sizzle and sizzle is really how I'm getting my private sector to continue to stay engaged. Like, yeah, they care about the cause, but there's some sizzle that they need to. And, uh, in that we're talking about, uh, standing up these neighborhood technology hubs. And, uh, one of the conversations people kept talking about, I was like, Oh, and we can have Wi-Fi and expand that. And I'm like, okay, guys, look, yes, we can not against that. I'm very happy that that's being brought up, but if we are not solving to the home, then I'm, I don't want this to be a distraction. Wi-Fi can, in many cases, end up being a distraction where you're like, oh, we have people doing that and that's great. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, that's meeting a need if you have no other option. But by no means should that be what you say, okay, whew, we did a good thing about Wi-Fi because it's like, no, it needs to be in the home. We need to make this something where it's like, oh, no different than me having my lights on, I have internet. And like, that's where we start talking about that adoption part. And I, um, you know, self, sometimes feel a little bit bad because I will shoot down ideas that people come to me in Detroit saying, oh, well, what about this? We could do this. I'm like, guys, we have to make sure that we're hitting the mark. We have to make sure that as people want to hire and tech skills is something that, that they're looking for, that we have people where internet isn't something that they're worrying about. And like, that's kind of the level and the threshold we need to be operating at. Um, but you know, at the same time, I fully understand, um, that if Wi-Fi is the solution we go with, absolutely. My, my dad is a minister. Like I grew up in the churches. I, I understand it. Like, you know, how many times I told people, my name is Joshua and someone brings up a Bible reference. Like, yeah, I know. Um, but like, that's something when I'm talking to my churches, I'm now saying, okay, we've been saying for years, how do we get these communities connected? How do we do this? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, maybe it's not for me to say, maybe it's pastor saying this, maybe it's deacon saying this. And that's like, again, empowering these people to say things that otherwise that I could be right, but still wrong in someone else's eyes and being cognizant of that. Um, the, the last thing I'll say um, is when we're having this conversation, I saw someone put in the chat, corporate America needs to step up. I 100% agree. Uh, and that's why like, I'm happy we have some of our corporate partners we do. That wasn't easy to get to that point, but one of the things I said, and this might be a, a point for anyone else who's doing this work in other cities, American community surveys where we usually get a lot of our data to frame the issue. That's where we're saying, okay, 20, 30% don't have internet of any kind. Like that's where those numbers come from. The problem with it is it's, there's a two year lapse on the data. And so all of the strides that we made in 2020, we're not really gonna see that data until 2022. So what person is going to want to invest knowing that there's going to be a two year lapse? Definitely not anyone in corporate America. <laughs> they have to be able to say, what's the impact that we had? And so what we've been uh, really focused on is creating the, well, we, we literally are saying it, the best data set on digital inclusion on the planet. And we mean that. Um, now that's obviously the North star. However, we get there, you know, we're, we, we got to figure some things out, but it's like empowering not just me, but empowering other people to see the value of that data and saying like, we own this narrative. And so as we are making any type of investments in this space to reduce this issue, we're doing it in a laser focused way. That's not at the census track level, not at the zip code level. We literally want to get to the street level. Okay, where are the gaps and where are the issues and how do we fund accordingly? Because right now, if we're just saying, oh, 30% don't have this, we just throw it out there. And like, that doesn't really stick and it doesn't really convey investment confidence. 
And so when I want to have more investment from my corporate folks come in, I need to make sure we're protecting their investments, but at the same time, we're in lockstep with the community so that we're not just throwing things out there too. So it's a really fine line that we have to walk, but it's definitely something that's doable. And I think that as we have continue to have more conversations like this, I think your corporate folks are receptive. They want to invest more, but their investments have to be protected. And I think that's where I'm going to keep pushing folks locally and nationally on that tip. Hey, so I'm, I'm gonna guys, to, yeah. I'm going to uh, use the prerogative of, of the convener, Larry, just for a second. I'm going to mm -hmm. try to kind of bring it home because we got we got just about 15 minutes uh, here. 14. Larry, you started the conversation with a 25-year retrospective. And um, I read that as um, you basically saying much was, uh, you said prologue, you know, there was, there was a lot there back in those, uh, in your insights back in the day. If we're going to look forward to the next 25 years, I'd like to invite each of you to just comment on, at two levels. What do we need from our, our next administration at the federal level and, and the Congress? And also at the same time, because I've heard this all evening, what also are the most practical steps that we can take at the local level? Because this is, a, this is both a national issue where American exceptionalism in this regards is, is a tragedy. Um, and at the same time, we've got local context, which um, you know, Nicole's uh, field research, uh, when it comes out in the book and hurry up already, uh, you know, is going to really give us insights as to uh, you know, where the rubber hits the road locally. So let me invite you to just sort of look 25 years from now, it'll be 2045. Um, and um, what can we do both at the national and uh, state level if it's appropriate, although I know all of you operate uh, at, you know, with insights at the bigger picture, as well as what can communities do uh, to actually advance their own uh, interests in the next uh, two decades? I'm gonna go last this time because I went first last time. So I'm gonna let you all start. Cause I actually have some, I, I know what I want to say but I want to hear what y'all have. All right, Josh, and I'm going, I'm going to let you start. We're gonna go backwards but I'm also gonna keep some time here cause I want to make sure that we get everyone. So let's keep it to five minutes, uh, four to five minutes each. And if I try to bark in, it's only uh, as the prerogative to try to move the conversation forward. I, I promise you, I'm not even going to take five. Uh, I'm actually much more excited to see what Larry and Nicole say because, again, I mean, this is me on, on the ground in a government that, I mean, I have to figure this out. And so acquiescing to, to, to the superior knowledge in this is, is going to be helpful for me. I'll say on the, um, the, the national level, the federal government is, in many cases, you could say rightfully so, but whatever, they're afraid of nuance. And... That is reinforced by the argument that we're seeing so much. And I know I follow Larry on Twitter and he says this all the time, but like looking at like access is one thing of just straight up infrastructure and the federal government has a history of just saying, okay, access, access, access. And they won't touch like what's keeping people away from that access. Like why can't people afford this? Like what happens when you do build these affordable networks and then people still can't afford it? Then what? And like, that's something where I would be pressing the federal government to focusing on, okay, what are all the barriers that's keeping us from uh, Amer Americans collectively from adopting uh, technology? What are those barriers and how do you tailor your strategy according to that? Because any anything else, in my opinion, it isn't really going to be one useful at the local level. Whenever I see things that are so hyper-focused to one thing, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to even do with that because the problem is so nuanced here. So I would just say on the national part there and then locally, um, us, just, uh, uh, us cities having one appointed people with some actual power to get this work done and taking it serious and understanding all of the intersections and what we lose as a community by not being connected. Um, you know, when I'm not connected, that's actually bad for the gig, the gig economy and the workforce in my community and making that known enough for other folks to be able to say, oh, wow, well, I don't want to have anyone unconnected because that's bad for my business. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, it's a humanitarian issue, sure. But like at the end of the day, it's bad for this, bad for that, bad for that. And getting people to understand that right now, I think that puts us on the track where we're able to correct our path because right now we're not hitting it right. Yeah. So I would say, um, to your question, and, and let me just make sure, because I'm a little older than Josh. <laughs> I captured this right. Uh, 
uh, in terms of what's the national strategy, what should be the local strategy is what I think I hear you say. So, I mean, clearly, I think what we're actually talking about right now, and I love the way Josh talks about the reliance on the private sector, but I, and I'm watching the comments around, well, then should we go to a full government model? I think in the past, we've been either or, right? We've either tried to go towards a full government deployment of broadband technologies, or we've tried to rest upon the moral compass of the private sector to do so. And I think Josh points it quite well, that obviously anything that's based on a return and investment model is not gonna deploy broadband uh, nationally. And so I think we're at this crossroad right now where we actually have to think about a little bit of both, in my opinion. I mean, one part of it is, there is the, the uh, you know, the private sector has invested a lot of money in broadband networks. These are privately owned networks that we're actually riding off right now while we're having this Zoom call. And those networks have been invested in over the years. Now, whether or not that's good or bad is another story, but it's the nature of the regulatory climate back in the days when uh, former FCC chairman uh, Michael Powell was a Republican and former FCC chairman Bill Kennard as a Democrat decided to take a hands-off approach to the internet. So now we're at a crossroads where, as Larry said, that it's not so much that the internet is, is bad, but there are pernicious things that come out of the internet as a result of these models of uh, market failure, uh, that how they contribute to market failure, right? And that's now being seen on both the uh, deployment side in terms of infrastructure, but it's also being seen on the side of the applications and the platforms that we write off of. Think about government interference. Think about, you know, election integrity. Think about privacy infractions. Think about, you know, big data. All of that actually contributes to the larger di digital ecosystem. So one of the things I'm trying to think about then is I think as a country, when we start to actually coalesce federal and national federal strategies with local strategies or federal strategies in particular, we failed universal service in this country when it comes to making broadband available for all. We still have universal service programs that are still based and rooted in a telecommunications infrastructure when the telephone service was there. We've got new players like platform companies that do not give towards universal service fund. We actually treat universal service incrementally, which is why it rides off a return of investment. So whether or not a company wants to deploy in a rural area or in urban areas where there's less competition. We really need to think about broadband, and this is a new provocative idea I've been working around which is thinking about broadband the same way that we look at food safety net programs. Programs that we as a national appropriation make it a responsibility to make sure that our people are taken care of. There should have been no way that we went through this pandemic and locally superintendents, workers, employers had to figure out how to do this by themselves. I thought that was shameful as well because this is an issue that obviously the breakage in coverage was going to affect not just school age kids, but grandparents and other family members who needed access because of social distancing. So that's the first thing. See, the second thing that we need to think about in terms of empowering local digital infrastructure. So Larry talked about, and I remember that program because I was one of the beneficiaries, when government invested in communities in meaningful ways. Now, because of COVID, I think we need to be thinking about how do we get some of this Department of Education money that has not traditionally supported connectivity most of the money has rested in the Federal Communications Commission. How do we go get some of this utility money that hasn't normally been allocated towards broadband and really bring in new players that can actually contribute to this pot of funding that can actually support local solutions? Um, I always get concerned, and, and Josh, I was hearing what you're saying in terms of relying on the private sector, but what if the private sector decides that they don't want to invest in a community? What if down, you know, the, the far battles of Mississippi are not a worthwhile investment for even a philanthropy to give computers to? We should not have people try to figure that out. Now, the last thing I would say, I see a lot of comments saying, should we go towards public utility? I'm gonna leave this example because I'm, I've been publicly known about talking about this. I like the way Flint, Michigan handled people's water. I don't know if I'm gonna trust the government handling my broadband <laughs> going forward. I think having a conversation of what role government plays and filling those gap stops, helping to actually provide the seed funding that maybe partners with local companies or private sector companies, whatever the case may be. I think the government has to play a role, but I'm not sure if I want the government to regulate broadband, given the fact that could we even rate regulate what broadband looks like for people, given the fact that the price continues to go down and the modalities continue to change. So all I would say going forward, and I was just talking about this, I think we could solve, Josh, the uh, infrastructure problem by thinking about legislation. I think we could actually solve the training problem by starting to provide money, what Lev is doing here, to colleges, local community colleges, and educational workforce centers, et cetera, to actually do that. I think the hardest piece that we will solve is the device problem. 
because that's still based on a market-driven model that has not been successful so far historically and pushing broadband out to people. There's a study that came up that said, even if you offer low-income people broadband for $1.99, they still wouldn't take it. So I think on the device issue, it's really trying to figure out how do we get those devices to those families. All right, Nicole, I'm gonna stop you there and give the ball to Larry to bring it home. Bring it home, brother. So here's the reality. I'm not gonna do 25 years because that's too long in technology terms. We do 25 <laughs> right, months. Right. 25 years is impossible. We, we predicted the iPhone in 1993 and it took till 2007 before it existed. And anybody who doesn't believe me, I will send you the link to our report in September, 1993. Here's the reality. We need more competition against the carriers. We have companies like Comcast that proudly crow about 25-3 um, as the standard. When 12 years ago, I was talking about that the Obama administration should make 100-100 the national standard. So 20 years, 12 years after 100-100 should be standard, I got a company that I respect in a lot of ways, acting as if they're doing people a favor by giving them 25-3. And they're giving them 25-3 because they're trying to protect the upper end of their market. We need to have competition against the existing providers. One of the things that I've been telling everybody who will listen, we need to do right now. If, if, if Mr. Trump wins again, this is almost irrelevant because the reality is he doesn't care about the urban and suburban disconnected. The FCC right now is gonna spend 80, I'm sorry, gonna spend $20 billion to connect 5 million rural households. And those rural households deserve to be connected. But there are 20 million before the pandemic, urban and suburban households that aren't connected, and the Trump administration and the Trump FCC, some of whom my friends, don't have one minute's time for those urban and suburban disconnected. So unless Biden wins and that Build Back Better program happens, nothing happens. And here's what everybody on this phone, on this, on this call should, on this conference should know. At the campfire, the next three to five months are critical for what's gonna happen for the next three to five years. Because I've been on part of two transitions. I was part of the Clinton-Gore transition as part of the Obama transition. And that's when all the good ideas get thought of and get funded. You need to start thinking now, if Mr. Biden wins, what do we need? And I'm going to tell you one thing we need. Every, every city, every town, every hamlet has a public school, has a public library, has community colleges, has colleges, has museums, has, art, um, um, uh, has a, um, uh, public housing. Every one of those institutions should have a gigabit network into those facilities. And every one of them should have a stick on top of that facility that has unlicensed spectrum that's available for people. And you can keep that spectrum, that'll be very fast, it'll get there quickly, and it will be a very cost-effective way of doing it. I can connect any community in the country. Once I get that gigabit network in, I get that stick up top, it's less than five to $10,000 to make that, and, and it doesn't cost me much to maintain it. And here's the other reality, in Queens we talked about, 40%, 40% of the small businesses in New York City don't have access to a gigabit network. Every business in, in, in downtown Manhattan, every business on Wall Street has a gig network, and you can drive five miles away across the Brooklyn Bridge or 10 miles away near Kennedy Airport, and none of the black, brown, or immigrant businesses have access to a gig network. If you get a gig network into the schools, the libraries, the community, uh, to the public housing, community colleges, all of a sudden that line is running through that you can tap into those lines and give other people access. We have options, we have choices. My shameless plug, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time right now, but I'm doing blogs, I'm doing interviews, I'm doing, um, I don't have a Brookings platform, but if you follow Larry Irving on, on um, LinkedIn, you follow me on Twitter, you're gonna, I'm gonna be prolific, but I can't be part of this um, Biden transition, but I sure can talk to my friends, many of whom I've worked in the past, about what we need to do. If Mr. Biden doesn't take as one of his biggest build back better, broadband to every person in this country. If that's not one of his moonshots, he'll have failed us. There is no more important tool during a pandemic when our children aren't being educated, when low income people don't have access to telehealth, when 27% of senior citizens in this country, people we want to stay out of stores and out of public squares, don't have access to broadband in this country. If this isn't the most important investment they made in terms of infrastructure, they're failing the American people. So my guess is the next 25 months, and over those next 25 months, competition, building out the public infrastructure, and giving some local control over how people use these um, technologies. Learning human people, please join me in thanking our wonderful campfire conversation this evening.
Thank you to Larry. Thank you to Nicole. Thank you to Josh. You guys are inspiring. You guys are visionary. You're prophetic. And you're spot on with the need to actually be relevant. 